welcome to the European Youth Media Days 2015 in Brussels. My name is Dubriana Tropankeva. And my name is Juho Mäki Lohiluoma. A hundred young media makers are gathered to cover the topic of freedom of the press. Media freedom is one of the pillars of the European Union, especially Western and Scandinavian countries are proud of their tradition of free press. However, in the name of national security, national interest, regulation of media and privacy laws in many European countries are little by little limiting media freedom. These acts have chilling effects that cannot be taken for granted. Is it in the power of the European Union to change this cause? Find out from the report. On a worldwide scale of media freedom, European countries traditionally rank very high. However, that doesn't mean Europe isn't facing its own challenges. 2015 World Press Freedom Index by Reporters Without Borders, for instance, shows a drastic decline in freedom of information, leading to a divided Europe. So you have countries where the situation in media has not really uh, eroded too much. Uh, but you have a number of countries where you have a number of phenomena that are quite uh, worrisome. According to the World Press Freedom Index, European countries rank from the top with Finland and to the 106th place for Bulgaria. The Scandinavian countries have a long tradition of promoting free press. But countries such as Bulgaria and also Hungary deal with governments interfering press freedom. Can the EU allow to have a country which bluntly says we are for illiberal democracy, which is against the fundamental values of the European Union? But that's not the end of legislative limitation of media freedom. Some member countries restrict freedom of press as well by passing anti-terrorism laws in the name of national security. The reaction of some government to pass some new uh, laws and regulation to protect their citizens from uh, terrorism and extremism is going in a direction that may actually um, infringe of media on media freedom. With digitizing media landscape, social media are often mentioned as a way to escape controlling powers and to stimulate freedom of speech. But can they offer enough in-depth information? Social media is usually uh, sort of on the very surface, very short sound bites. Do they give the right background? Do they give any background? And my take on it is that we need sort of the background information. We need to have the big picture, not just the, the small picture. Can the European Union contribute to improve media freedom? Members of the parliament admit they don't have the proper mechanisms to deal with this problem. It is also questionable how much power the European Union should have to interfere with internal issues of member states. If we would step in, that's sort of going back to some sort of state monopoly again, sort of Soviet style. The big bosses are coming in and saying what you should write. I don't think that's gonna. I don't, that's not gonna fly. Well, I would also say that it's the the work of everyone to 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 defend media freedom. I think no one should ever forget that without a, a free media, you don't have democracy. It seems like European politics is bound in their interference to increase media freedom around Europe. Journalists themselves face the difficult task of not bending under pressure and achieving the higher standards of their profession. But European citizens as well can raise their voices for media freedom and don't settle for insufficient and superficial information. After all, information is power. From Brussels, Petra Prescheren and Lotte Kamphuis. Self-censorship is one of the wide array of problems in journalism and even in politics. Veselina Fotova and Christian Gall were in Brussels to find out more about self-censorship without self-censorship. Have you ever felt that something made you express something different than you wanted? Yes or no? Maybe your hesitation is also some sort of self-censorship? Here in Brussels, self-censorship is being neglected as a less important element of the big picture. People make choices and journalists make choices. And in, this, in the EU countries, we still have uh, uh, the luxury uh, of making choices. Unfortunately, in some countries, like let's say uh, my neighboring Belarus, many journalists do not have that luxury because there are certain external restrictions and they can face very fierce in my career I also changed the newspaper because at a certain point I got the impression that uh, what I was writing uh, 
was not censored by any by any mean, but was wouldn't please my newspaper, so was not in line with the line of my newspaper. So the, the choice was to stay there and to, in some way, self-censor myself or to leave, which I did. When you do it once, it's easier to do it twice, three times, and then at some point it becomes actually your model of work. Could you tell us more about the situation in Bulgaria? We are doing a survey on media freedom for the third time. Uh, now in 2015 and uh, what we are it, it's actually examining the way the journalists are feeling in Bulgaria this year there was a troubling uh, trend that uh, more than half of the people uh, admitted that they have uh, been using self-censorship for me personally I have rarely experienced moments where I was censoring myself Maybe with regards to uh, specific topics, for example, on human rights, where you know you're in a surrounding, where you get massive opposition if you're speaking about specific topics. The parliament, uh, from the policy-making side, is of course obliged to create a media environment, to create a, society envi a societal environment that has uh, freedom of expression as, as one of the basic values of the basic rights uh, of our societies. Politicians, journalists and advocacy experts are seeing self-censorship as a growing problem. Media ownership, political influence, tactics are all part of the reasons that somebody uses self-censorship. Of course, it differs in every region, but raising awareness is key to handle the situation. Vesena Foteva and Christian Gal from Brussels. Is Russian propaganda infiltrating European media and how is the European Union responding to it? A resolution passed in June recognized the problem and called on the Commission to act. Alistair Lane reporting. Russian propaganda. It could be on our phones, on our computers and, who knows, even in our newspapers. So concerned is the European community about the activities of Russian propaganda operatives, allegedly caught on camera here by Finnish broadcasters, that a new task force has been set up within the EEAS to counter Russian disinformation. The precise activities of the task force, presided over by EEAS chief Federica Mogherini, are yet to be announced, though it is understood that the 10-strong team is tasked with promoting EU policies in the Eastern neighbourhood through strategic media campaigns. It was here, in the European Parliament in Brussels, that the resolution was passed calling on the EU Commission to up its efforts against Russian propaganda. The initiative has been largely welcomed by MEPs, though some are hesitant to use the label propaganda, including a shadow rapporteur of the resolution. The idea is very good, I welcome it. Not the word propaganda, because that I don't really like. We know that we can never defeat propaganda with counter-propaganda. So, but uh, this idea is more crystallized uh, in recent months, so that it's more uh, to promoting to our neighbors European values. Outside of the parliament, there are concerns, however, that not enough is being done. Russian propaganda is a serious challenge for the European Union um, and the kind of response that we see today from uh, the EU institutions is a good first step, however it is not sufficient. Uh, there needs to be more uh, proactive response uh, and not only a reactive policy, there needs to be more flexibility in uh, the instruments that are uh, created to respond to Russia. Russian uh, propaganda. The Russian Foreign Affairs Ministry has been robust in its denial of propagandist activity, accusing the EU of restricting media freedom and discriminating against the Russian press. With the task force still in its infancy and staff funding currently coming directly from member states, it remains to be seen just how far the EU will take its campaign against Russian propaganda.
this is the 8th edition of the European Youth Media Days, organized by the European Youth Press and the European Parliament. Dobriana, you have been uh, reporting on the event. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yes, of course. I had the pleasure of interviewing the organizers. Find out a little bit more of what does it take to organize the European Youth Media Days from the report. Welcome to the European Youth Media Days 2015. These are 100 young journalists coming from across Europe and they're going to cover the topic of freedom of the press in a number of workshops and panel discussions. The European Youth Media Days is a unique event offering young media makers access to the European Parliament. They participate in discussions with high-profile journalists and interview policymakers. The 2015 event started with a panel discussion on the European Parliament's role in supporting media freedom in the EU and its neighbourhood. The European Parliament, uh, as an institution uh, representing 500 million of citizens, an institution which is not only making legislation but it, which is also supporting values, has to um, support the freedom of press. Free Hour Media is another project of the European Youth Press that supports media freedom in Europe. Throughout uh, this uh, year we have involved uh, young journalists from 15 European countries and cartoonists um, to also organize local events and to talk about the topic of media freedom and to try and find out what are the biggest challenges in each locality and in each country and to also try and see what, not only what are the problems but also what are the solutions. The participants meet for first time at the event and in less than 24 hours they have to produce a TV and radio show, a magazine and multimedia stories. They gain skills in media production and work in cross-cultural teams. The most valuable thing in organizing the EYMD is to communicate with the people from different EU states, but not only EU, but also non-EU member states. So you can meet many people who, who have the different like points of view on different things. And also to meet people from the European Parliament and to discuss with them. Working in the European Parliament can lead to also unexpected discoveries. The biggest secret which I discovered in the European Parliament are these secret doors in one of the corridors. And they are really not visible because the whole wall is just white and in one place there, there are the doors. So this is the biggest secret of the European Parliament which I discovered. The European Youth Media Days is only one project of the European Youth Press. With over 60,000 young media makers, the network is rapidly expanding. Our current priority is to grow the network bigger and bigger. And, well, the main focus is to be actively working to promote media freedom and enhancing democracy processes uh, at EU level but also at local level. So I would say that we welcome any organization that is active in the media youth related field at EU level and that would like to well grow a little bit bigger and be welcome in a network of media makers. To find out more about journalism projects and membership just check the European Youth Press website. The refugee crisis. The UNHCR is currently addressing the concerns of more than 4 million refugees directly affected by the violence in Syria. The number of Syrians arriving in Europe seeking international protection continues to increase. Chespin Kerber reporting on the media coverage on the issues. We can read, we can see what has happened in Europe, in our cities, on social media and on television. This is one of the biggest humanitarian crises in 10 years. We can read about the threat of the refugees, how our governments struggle to allocate them fairly. You can even read that Europe is not ready to support them. But we barely hear from the refugees ourselves. Here in Brussels, close to the Gare du Nord, many refugees affected by the Syrian crisis spend their days waiting for the approval of their asylum application. Saleh Shabar is one of them. Now 21 years old, he had to flee the Assad regime last year after being imprisoned for several days. He is unhappy about the media coverage on the crisis. They are talking that uh, a lot of refugees now in Europe, but daily it's nothing. You know, in Turkey, there are two million Syrians. 
that refugees, Syrian refugees, they, they don't come to Europe just for economic situation or something like that. Really, we had our life in Syria, uh, we had our own lives, just we lost everything, we don't have any place to stay, just we went to your country just to find safe place, to continue normal life like any human. The number of applications in the EU is still relatively low in comparison to Syria's neighboring countries, such as Lebanon or Jordan, where there are around 90% of the refugees. But the 10% of refugees that make their way to the Western Hemisphere are rarely in the news, which raises the question, how important is it to cover personal stories of refugees? Jean-Paul Matos takes a stance on it. He works as a Brussels correspondent for the Committee to Protect Journalists and has been covering humanitarian issues for NGOs as well as for traditional media for over 20 years. It, we have to, to make sure that the, the discussion that will take place on migration and migration policies in Europe uh, is based on facts and on as many facts that are double-checked and validated as possible. A valid point, but where does that leave room for the refugees' personal stories? Euronews' James Franny covered the refugee crisis on the ground. He rode the train with the refugees all the way from Macedonia up north. Um, we've heard enough from people with uh, wearing suits and ties uh, in Brussels. We've heard all that. Um, how was that journey for them? What were they leaving behind in Syria? And I was also asking them, what kind of welcome uh, do you expect in Europe? But when you're on the trail with those people, I think it's important to give them uh, a voice because it's not always heard. Uh, and that should be the focus of your work. In the meantime, Salah Shabar, the 21-year-old Syrian, has other problems. He is waiting for his asylum request to be processed so he can make his dreams come true. I had, I had many jobs in Syria. I, I want to be a teacher because I love children and maybe volunteer too. If we want it or not, the refugees arriving at our borders every single day are an important factor in Europe's future. By not listening to their stories and by keeping them mute, we will continue to miss out on an important piece in the puzzle. ISIS. Everyone talks about the Islamic State. Could psychosis and emulation be a threat for Europe? Claudio Locatelli and Jana Fintova reporting from Brussels. Europe. Three years ago, the Islamic State did not exist. Now it controls vast areas of Syria and Iraq, and moreover, vast area of our public debate. The word ISIS is everywhere, dominating the global media even more than the battlefield. Nevertheless, currently there are 100 military or paramilitary groups on the EU-designated terrorist organization list. Some of them control more territory than ISIS, others have a longer existence, others again are operating in more countries. The list is long. Just an example, FARC controls directly or indirectly a huge part of Colombia. The real Irish Republican Army exists since 1997. Al-Qaeda have operation in almost 30 countries. Did you already know some of them? No. Do you know Hamas? No. Do you know FARC? Real IRA? No. Le Brigate Zene di Al Qassam? No. Sapete cosa sono le FARC? Boko Haram? Real IRA? Irish Republican Army? No. Do you know ISIS? Yeah. ISIS I know, yeah. L'ISIS? Sì. Eh? Sì, l'abbiamo sentito ultimamente. Okay. ISIS? You know the Islamic State? Yes. Every time the word ISIS enters in our daily life, we implicitly contribute to increase its visibility. Psychosis and furthermore, dangerous emulation can rise up everywhere. Swedish police broke in a birthday party, confusing a, a 21st birthday balloon site from the outside window with an acronym of IS of the Islamic State. Emulator terrorist cells appears in Lebanon, Israel and even in Canada. But the emulator and the psychosis created by this name all around Europe is spread the name of ISIS. So Islamic State is spread more than on the battlefield. The reality is they are existing. And one, of, one element of their strategy is, as you described it, to be present, 
via using the most modern instruments of uh, communication all over in Europe. And another goal is everybody should speak about them with fear. And this is creating what you uh, uh, described as a kind of psychosis. ISIS is relatively strong in Syria and Iraq, but not so strong as the power of broadcast its message with our voice. Emulator, psychosis, and advertise its existence as the real threat for Europe. Claudio Locatelli and Diana Fintova from, from Brussels. Brussels. With professional videos and a social media strategy, the Islamic State manages to recruit people from all over Europe. This challenges the governments and institutions to find strategies that could solve the problem. Follow our team to find out more. Islamic State's way of using propaganda is a relatively new strategy, and it seems to work. In Belgium alone, 500 people left the country to fight with Islamic State in the past five years. A shift in the way they are recruited takes place, from radicalized fellow Muslims in Belgium to Islamic State's messages on social media. Well, I think what is clear is this is a new phenomenon where we've got these this new modern techniques of communication, and social media is one of those. We're seeing that these extremist elements are using it very effectively, that they're tweeting out. It's one of those means that they use, of course, they do the video as well, the Facebooks and all the others. But the tweeting is the one where they've been really aggressive at. Something like 90,000 tweets are being pumped out, uh, which people globally can actually see. So it is an issue. We need to be thinking about it and we need to tackle it. According to the International Center for the Study of Radicalization, about 20,000 foreign fighters joined the fights in both Syria and Iraq. A relatively high number comes from the Western European countries. France, United Kingdom and Germany have the highest number of people joining the fight. Relative to population size, the most heavily affected countries are Belgium, Denmark and Sweden. We are trying to... Um I would say not regulate, but to control what is happening on the website. I fully support complete free access to the Internet because this is um, an opportunity to modern society. But on the other hand, of course, um, what is happening when we look at the terrorism and the, how the social media can be violated, I fear they are always a step ahead of us. The strategy of the European Union focuses on contra-propaganda. The first step in stopping young Muslims from joining Islamic State is making sure they feel integrated into society. We have to talk with young people from the perspective of those young that are properly integrated, maybe through the radio program, again through social media, to make some contra-propaganda for the European values. Because the problem is really this disintegration to the society. Islamic State's professional use of social media platforms shows that traditional tools of terror and propaganda have changed significantly. The number of fighters joining IS from the West is not decreasing, which means that an effective solution is needed. However, the question is how long it will take to find an efficient strategy to win this online battle. Gabriele Gidvelaita, Laura Krut, Brussels. Self-censorship, ISIS, Russian propaganda, and media laws limiting press freedom. That was it for our show this year. Thank you for joining us here in Brussels. It was a pleasure having you on board. And see you again next year. <laughs>